the, the nice thing about it, if I if I'm not under don't have so many deadlines, that makes me able to, hey, I think I'm gonna do something in porcelain. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna have all these squiggle things out of them because I don't I don't have a deadline, so I can experiment. So that's that shift for me has been freeing. Hi, I'm Bob Acton, and I'm pleased to share my conversation with the award-winning sculptor Margaret Keelan. Trained at the University of Saskatchewan, Canada, and at the University of Utah in the United States, Keelan was taught under the great Joe Fafard and Marilyn Levine. She eventually moved to California, where she now resides, and she joined the faculty at the San Francisco Academy of Art, where she taught graduate and undergraduate level ceramics classes. Margaret produces some fantastic figurative work that I'm sure you'll love when you check out her work on Instagram or at the John Natsoulis Gallery in Davis, California. All that information are in the show notes. So let's get to the interview. Welcome to Color and Ceramics, the podcast for ceramic artists who want valuable ideas about using color from leading artists and world-class experts. Here's your host, Bob Acton, a sculptor and ceramic artist who's fascinated with color and how potters, sculptors, and artists use color in their work. Tune in as he talks with his guests about color, techniques, and the impact of color on people and art itself. Uh, Margaret, thanks so much for joining us today on the Color and Ceramics podcast. I'm excited uh, that you're here with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yes, it's absolutely great that you're here. I really love your use of color and texture and, um, and that you have on your work. And there's certainly a theme there to your work that uh, you've had for a number of years now. So I'm really excited about talking with you about how you approach your surface design. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, before we get going talking about those kinds of things, I wonder if you could give the audience a little sense of your journey in clay. And uh, I know when you and I were at the uh, conference last week, and um, that was at the California Conference for the Advancement of Ceramic Arts. That's a mouthful. And uh, you and I were there in California. Uh, we had a great time having a conversation down there. We and I both realized that we were from Saskatchewan. And for many of the people in the audience, we'll see if you can spell Saskatchewan. And, uh, and so that was nice to see that we had some commonality there. But I wonder if you could just sort of tell people a little bit about uh, where you've come from and what you're doing these days. Well, I was raised in England, and then my family moved to uh, Saskatchewan, and I went through uh, college, high school and college there. And I think um, I ended up in the arts section of the University of Saskatchewan. But it wasn't until I saw work, it was actually interesting, it was during the Vietnam War. And we got a an artist there called Jim Thornsbury from Seattle. What he brought was some astonishing images of the work that was being done in ceramics in California. Mm. So Patty Washina, who's still around, was one of those people that got me very excited. Um, and uh, there was all sorts of people. Um, and on the sort of outer rim of that was Peter Volkus. But it was the whole uh, renaissance in ceramics in California. And that was when I was going to the end of my school, schooling, uh, college schooling. And I just got incredibly excited because up until that point, like a lot of young, very young artists, embryonic artists, we're always searching for a voice. We're always searching for an image as we're accumulating experience and skills. So that got me very excited. And it turns out that at that time, uh, a very well-known ceramic artist, Marilyn Levine, was working in Saskatchewan. She was from Alberta. She did a workshop in the summer in Saskatchewan, invited by Jim Thornsbury. And then she ultimately went down to Salt Lake City, Utah, and then moved on to California in order to join the crew, Peter Volkus being a, a particular friend of hers. And to go uh, to join a, uh, a group that was at the Dome in Oakland. Mm. So she basically, she was a real mentor. She was very, very supportive of me. And she did trompe l'oeil ceramics. But at that point, I wasn't interested in that particular uh, approach. Um, but I did go down to Salt Lake City to study with her. She got me in, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And I worked with her. Then I moved also on to uh, the Bay Area and was influenced by a lot of what was going on. But I was very interested in the figure, which was fascinating because nobody was doing figure. And a lot of people who were interested in figurative work in ceramics, and there's a lot of them now, would my age would say the same thing. They're self-taught because there wasn't the academic figure being taught in very many places. But mm. I really like that. As a matter of fact, I got into a bit of a spat with Marilyn over that. Because I said, oh, I like it. She said, but I don't, but I like it. So we got into <laughs> an argument over it. Um, but, uh, and then when I went into the Bay Area, I basically wanted to increase my skills. So I had a model. I was working from the middle, uh, from the figure in porcelain. And at that time, I didn't know anything about the the techniques involved in modeling a figure. So I would do it solid and porcelain, and it would blow up in the kiln, and then I would glue them all back together. It looked very contemporary, inadvertent <laughs> contemporary. Okay. But it wasn't until about 2008, interesting, because I taught at, at the Academy of Art University, which is a sort of an academic figurative school in the Bay Area, one of the few of the East Coast, so I really honed my figurative skills there, but I taught there for a number of years, starting 1994. But it wasn't until 2008 that that I just that I wanted to go with this sort of weathered wood look, and I think it was because my art is sort of autobiographical, and there is so sort of buried in that image aspects of my own personality and my own personal journey. Mm -hmm. So at that time I was getting older, and I was growing up and realizing the changes that take place as you get more mature. <laughs> I was a little late. But anyway, so what, but there was a very important uh, incident in which when I was, before I got my teaching job, I and another friend of mine were, was, were scraping the interior of a house. That's how you pick up a little extra cash, preparing it for painting. And this house was owned by a guy for 20, 30, 40 years, most of his life. So our job was to scrape down the inside of the house layer upon layer upon layer of paint. And what I realized was that each color of paint as we scraped it away represented a period of that person's life. And it was like the rings of a tree. And I, that stayed with me. So when I get around to 2008, I'm thinking, well, you know, I would love to do something like that. And I also liked the look of weathered wood. So basically what happened was the concept preceded the technique. Because what I did then was do test upon test upon test to get that look of weathered wood and then flaked paint on weathered wood. So, and that as I got better, you know, I, I got better. It took a number of years to, to figure out how to do it without it all falling off. But that was how that evolved. It was a, a um, combination of... A skill, skill plus concept, you know, sort of fusing together. Yeah, very interesting. You know, it's interesting that you say it took me a number of years. And I remember listening to Lisa Clegg down in uh, California, and uh, she was she was doing a demo of her work, and she was talking about how her use of or her ability to get the figures she wants now took her years and that she made many that she wasn't very happy with. And it's interesting, isn't it, how the evolution of our work takes so long when many of us want to have something done quickly. Well, on the other hand, I'll tell you something. This this is very interesting. Because of where I teach at a school, you could actually get to that point of skill within about a semester. Wow. If you yeah, if you're taught properly, you know, mm -hmm. if you, they put that figure in front of you and tell you what the what the, the proportions are, you can actually learn that. But when you're coming from out out of that area, and you're picking, uh, this is my theory. If you're picking yeah. that because it it resonates with you, uh, what happened actually is that I stepped out of that academic figure school because it 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 held me too close. Because I would work with a model, I was so intent on making it look like the model that I wasn't being inventive enough or interpretive enough in the figure. Mm -hmm. So basically what I did was that I stopped, I had to pull myself away. And that was why when I started to work with dolls, uh, and now what I do is work for pictures, but I do not use a model anymore. When initially, when I wanted to, when I was fascinated with the figure, that's what I did. I worked from a model. Yeah. And when I, and, and so I'm, I'm sort of, it's just my personal belief that 
people like Manuel Neri, people who have worked with the figures, start off with that background. Um, a lot of them, and then de and then sort of take it apart later on to make to to bring their own personal message into it. Mm -hmm. Just like you have with your dolls that you do now. Yeah, could have saved a little time if I'd gone back to school. <laughs> 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 that is true. That is true. But I suppose these days, many people are having struggles going to a school because it's so expensive and time consuming. And, um, you know, that they're going to local organizations and communities and guilds in order to learn some of the skills. That's true. And also with me, the idea preceded the technique. So mm -hmm. um, and, and then then I knew enough to sort of take what I needed and then pull away. So um, often with a school, you you know, you, you the students go in there and they sort of develop their ideas when they get out, you know, their personal skill set. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's everybody has their own journey. That's for sure. Absolute, absolutely. Now, now, you've got some interesting forms that you uh, have in your work. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you deal with the um, relationship between the color and the surface and the form that you use? Well, initially, I wanted to do a disintegrating figure. So my first image that I worked with was Santos figures and um, Americana, early American toys. In fact, I bought books. This was like 19, this was 2000. This was before we had the internet at our disposal. So I would buy books on, American sculptors that were made out of wood toys and how they started to get a look at the surface and the simplicity of the form as if it had been. Uh, so the story was, this has been done out of wood. So I wanted to show that it had been formed out of wood. Um, so my earlier work about, uh, let's see, my earlier work about early 2000s were basically inspired by Satos figures mm -hmm. because they were so that, you know, there were basically um, early colonial religious sculptors, very small, you know, 20 to 30 inches high, and they were done in the colonies. So there's not particularly good history attached to them, but you can find them in South and Central America. And they're rather exquisitely sculpted, like the head and the hands, but the body itself would be made out of simple wood because it would be clothed. So the older Santos, once they started to appear, had these exquisitely but slightly dis, um, slightly decaying heads and hands, and then these these basic wood forms that also look a little ratty. So I I thought those were so lovely. So my earlier pieces look like that, and I also used nineteenth um, century porcelain heads. So basically I pulled them out from other centuries and other times, not contemporary images, to put those together. And then I then I started to work the surface and make the surface look like they were disintegrating. And the, the forms evolved from Santos figures, very simple, small wooden uh, puppets to Santos figures to dolls. And then now they're sort of a hybrid between the doll face and then a much more sophisticated, modeled, hybrid, child, Blah, you know, so mm -hmm. they evolved over time. Now, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the uh, psychological message that you want to give people uh, with your use of that disintegrated surface. Yeah, thank you. Um, it is a sort of multi-layered because I, I really kind of enjoy it. It's like they're like a rug and they have all these threads going together like a little tartan rug meeting in this one image. Mm -hmm. So number one, I did the fun. I use a child face, not a, not a, because the, the forms kind of change over time according to the taste. So I use one that's not of our century even. Well, maybe 1920s actually is my favorite child look. So I pull that out and there, it, it talks about the innocence of childhood. I remember when I was younger, I thought, well, the moment something, you know, is discovered, it will be fixed if there's a flaw, you know. So there was this sort of fantasy of childhood and everything was sort of magic and new and fresh. And my childhood anyway, was pretty mm -hmm. good. So there was that. And then there was the, as you grow older, and, and then there was the fresh and new of all the surfaces. And then as you grow older, that surface starts to decline and it's not, and I mean that physically as well as mentally, 
but there is a sort of underneath there you can find your authentic person you become more real you can become if you're lucky um you kind of really find yourself and find out who you are and figure out who you are i mean that is a, that is what we would wish more as we grow up and older and then we all fall apart at the end but uh, there was a point when we don't so <laughs> there was that and and actually there was a period in which I did little ballet dances. Um, and when I was growing up in England, ballet was really big. Margot de Fontaine, and uh, this was post-war 1950s. And they were, I used to read comic books, English comic books. And the ballet dancer was also a detective. So it was very, you know, empowering for a young girl to realize that you could be feminine and you could be a kick-ass detective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, these and these were children's comic books, and I never forgot that juxtaposition of of uh, you know female empowerment, ballet, and all that. So that's another layer of childhood and and empowerment and growing up and growing older and looking back at your younger self. And that's also why I include. Um, animals and it's usually cats, dog, the animals that surround me because I live in an urban setting. And but I live by a creek, and there, you know, when a squirrel comes, it's magic to me. A wild creature, you know, <laughs> they're not really, you know, but that's it's exciting to me. I don't live in the country, yeah, so yeah. that's woven in also imagery that I see from my door and woven into my pieces. Wow, very complex ideas that, uh that people can engage with when they see your work. I know when I was uh, recently in California, I got a chance to see your work in person. And sometimes, you know, when we see things digitally on the internet, it's not quite as good as when you see it uh, in person. How I wonder how you, so you've got some interesting uh, strategies with the, the, your use of materials. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about color and how you use color to inform uh, your piece. Well, my pieces are basically, um, I, I noticed that it was interesting that you mentioned the piece that was in the gallery. It was, it's, it's a few years old. It's one of my older pieces, but I really like it. It's from my personal collection. I try and hold on to a few pieces. But I did notice that it was a very where it was, it really contrasted with the rest of, with the rest of the work because it was so dark, uh, it, it, dark and sort of rich and sort of monochromatic. Hmm. There was not a lot of color, and and the colors initially that I used were also sort of antique colors, you know, like off white and not hmm. snow white, or a certain kind of a blue that that looked kind of old fashioned blue. They weren't bright colors. They were kind of dark colors. I've used red sometimes on bases just just because. You know, sometimes I do things just because. A lot of ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but they do, and and they're all dark because I do do a dark wash. I build up my surfaces over uh, over time and do multiple firings. So mm -hmm. that darkness is as a result of a dark wash over the whole thing, and that is also what I teach. Um, because I have a, a history of, uh, I've taught for a long time too, and I approach uh, uh, sculptural surfaces way more differently than I would approach, say, wheel thrown work. They are approached as a painterly aspect, so to give you complete control over it. So I use, you know, underglazes, I use stained slips, I use washes, I use dry brushing, I use painterly techniques. Um, as opposed to what we would normally think of ceramics techniques. Mm -hmm. and the colors, uh, I use very muted colors because I want to keep that antique used look. I don't want it to be bright and crisp and clean because that's not the point of my pieces. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So you use sort of a mix, as you said, of slips and underglazes and stains and uh, probably a variety of other things that you get in there. That's really interesting. What what has been some of your challenges that you've had to do this complex work? Uh, <laughs> the first challenge I got was to get the, the, the that that flaked look to stay on and mm, not drop off. Of course. That that took a you know a, a multi. It was sort of like um, 
tombstone technology, as my brother, the engineer said, you know, if it screws up, it doesn't work, you know. Yeah, yeah. So you you actually have to try it experiential a lot of this because yeah. and, and kilns fire differently. My kiln is a is not fired by computer, it's fired by cone, and it fires differently than a kiln firing by computer. So um that's one of the challenges. I have to be completely consistent. Um in firing in the same kill, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because this there's, uh, you know, I sometimes only have like a 20 degree difference between the piece looking really crisp and, and crackled and the piece looking uh, smoother and cleaner and not what I want. So that's, and I always sort of fire and refire. And also if something doesn't work out, I simply have to grind it off and put it back in the kiln or, you know, I also, to get transitions, I would also use paint. I mean, so I'm not shy about that. Use non-ceramic surfaces and a lot of sculptural uh, ceramic artists do that mm -hmm. just to get what I want to get, because it's hard to get transitions of color, subtle transitions if you're, if you're using cer just ceramic surfaces. It's um, it's interesting you're talking about a 20 degree difference in your kiln. You know, the precision that you're working with is really quite interesting. Uh, and and then you also talk about how if you don't like it, you're just going to grind it off and start all over again on the piece. Right. That's uh, that's interesting. Is that something that uh, a younger uh, sculptor or potter could consider doing? Yes. I mean, but it's so funny with my students. It's really adorable. They say it's cracked, it's cracked, it's horrible. It doesn't work anymore, you know. And they're yeah. they're just they're so dismayed that it's not perfect. I said, ah, cracking is your friend. You can do all sorts of things with it, you know, glue it, for example. Yeah. So, the the thing that I teach my students is it's not the end of the world if it cracks or blows up or does anything because there's so many things you can do with it. And it's right. It's something I think it's it's a challenge for young sculptors specifically not necessarily wheel throwing because if you once you acquire the skill of wheel throwing it takes you just a few minutes to throw on the wheel so you're thinking in in large numbers of pieces you sculpt it can take you a month to get a piece sculpted so that i found that my students are much less willing to take risks and much more devastated if the thing doesn't turn out no yeah, so well, you've in, you've invested so much time exactly. right yes absolutely yes exactly and they're very dismayed if i you know if if it doesn't work out perfectly but i have all sorts of you know arrows in my quiver to pull one out say here try this do this do that and there are there's there's all sorts of you know post firing techniques also that um, my pieces um i'm working with porcelain right now mm -hmm. like i did when i first started out um, and that is a very unforgiving surface because it's very white. Um, to pivot back to my my surfaces that I'm most known for, they're very easy to fix because the surface is so busy. Mm. And so if you break it, it's very easy to patch it and to match the patch because it's so imperfect to begin with. So. Yes, absolutely. So you're using porcelain now, and you used to use porcelain. You went through a transition of using other clays. Can you talk a little bit about the clay that you use and what you like or dislike about them? Yeah, when I put porcelain, if you want to sculpt in porcelain and do something larger than a few inches, it's kind of a dumb thing to do. But there are some people that are, there are some people that do beautiful works in porcelain. Crystal Moray comes to mind. She does sculpture in porcelain. Um, but when I first started out, graduated, I really knew very little about clays. So I started out with porcelain. This was 1980s to 90s because it was a nice clay. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was and I would paint on top of it. And it was wonderful to paint with oil paints on top of it. So because I was out of school, that's what I had to do. And I just had one kill. Um, then I, when I pivoted into doing, when I went, to school to teach that was when I started to really study surfaces because I had to teach it so then I started to use um one very important thing I realized when I started to teach in a in a school of sculpture was that you didn't have to take the clay up to its point of vitrification mm -hmm. because the higher you took it the more it would shrink and the more it would warp so we took a lot of our pieces fairly low even if it was a stoneware clay so that's another thing and of course painting clay 
you know, you can do that because you're sculpting. So I had to let go a lot of my ceramic background when I started to teach at a, a school that taught figurative sculpture. So, um, but I actually picked the clay that I use on the wood pieces for its color. And because it was easier to sculpt uh, fairly large, and that's the first thing I teach my students is the first the first decision you make is what you're going to make. The second thing is how you're going to make and your choice of clay is that it, part of that. Now, that being said, I worked in porcelain because I just love it. So I struggle along to make larger scale porcelain pieces where basically I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so challenging. It's very challenging. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess one of the things that strikes me about that story you just told is that, is that when we work with uh, pottery as opposed to sculpture, there's a lot of, I'll call them rules that we have, you know, that the, the glaze must fit well so it doesn't crack and it's got to be food safe and so on and so forth, which are very appropriate for that kind of work. But sometimes that message get tra gets put upon sculptors. And so I know I felt that way when I started to do some sculptural work. That, oh gosh, it's got to be this and it's got to be that. But I think that I've learned and I've heard from you and other guests on the show here is that in sculpture, you there are hardly any rules. You can really do what you want with the piece. Yeah. The only rule I have, I do have a few rules because I have to ship my work. Mm. So I have to, I have to basically, and I have to move my work and put it into a kiln because it's a, it's a column. So I have to lift it up and put it down. And you know, my pieces are thirty-one inches high, the 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 larger standing pieces. So basically, they're designed to be moved and designed to be shipped. Mm. Um, I was talking to one Zing Zhang who makes actually these gigantic um, pieces. I said, did you, you, do you do them in sections? And he says, well, he puts them all together because they can be moved. They're so big that he basically moves them on a pallet and puts them into it. So he doesn't have to worry about that. But somebody like myself, who's like, does everything on a, everything on a smaller scale. Um, it has, I have to, and I have to do it all myself. I have to bear in mind what's going to happen to these pieces once I've built them. And where they're going to go and how I'm going to handle them. Yeah, that's a, an interesting thing that I've learned. Like if I've learned that if I put something small and fine, then it's really hard to pack it and move it and ship it, and it's easily broken. And so many of the, I guess what I'm getting at is that what um, we're thinking about today as we're building something, we have to think about what it's going to be like when it's done and when we're shipping it. Yes. Yes, and being a being an artist with a you know with a gallery, um, it's I've slowed down quite a bit because I've sort of semi retired, you know. Mm -hmm. So I so if I want to pivot and do something different, I can do that. And if it doesn't work out, I can do that. I'm I'm not under the gun like I used to be. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a bit of a what we call squirreling. I'm going off in another direction, but when I have a deadline. And I have to produce X number of pieces and they have to be shipped and packed and they have to get there in one piece. That doesn't leave me a lot of room for experimentation. Absolutely. So the nice thing about it, if I if I'm not under don't have so many deadlines, that makes me able to, hey, I think I'm gonna do something in porcelain, it's gonna be fun, it's gonna have all these squiggle things out of them because I don't I don't have a deadline, so I can experiment. So that's that shift for me has been freeing. Mm -hmm. And another word you've used a few times is fun. It seems to me that you've got to have some fun, at least you do, uh, yeah. when you're doing your work. Oh, yes. The process has to mean something. I mean, why else would we do it? I mean, who? what artists, when they can guarantee we're going to make a living or even any money off our work. So what is there left? Fun. You know, the challenge, the the feeling you get from growing the image and 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 the whole process of making creative decisions and the satisfaction you get out of that because you can't guarantee it's going to come from any place else. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think also I know as I've evolved you know, through working with clay, I feel like I've grown as a result of that. And through many of the challenge I ha challenges I might have with the actual piece itself helps me uh, grow as a person. Do you see that in your students? I do. And I also think it's going to become kind of surprising um, 
it's whole idea where where your ideas come from. When I was first starting out, um, I would do something and it would resonate me. By resonate, little tickle in your stomach. Say, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you don't. You may not know why that that feels. Why does Santos figures? Why does rotting wood appeal to me? You know. Um, and sometimes that's a clue, I think, that's coming out from your unconscious that that then you have to kind of decipher I if know. you feel like doing it. So it's kind of like therapy. And I noticed that my students, um, they will, they'll start out with some kind of image from their, I get a, a number of Chinese students. So the image that they, they, they will put into my assignments will be images growing up on the internet, growing up with certain images around them. And other students will pick other images, you know, so they'll start off with familiar images. And as yeah. they develop, they'll, they'll mind, they go a little deeper. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. As we watch that process, yeah. as pe people get better. Well, what advice would you have for a young person starting off in clay? Uh, what, what, what approaches should they take to allow that, that growth to occur? Well, first of all, they would need, this is what I always tell my students, they need a place to work. Yeah. You know, they need a, a private place where, where they can put their stuff and where they can build. They need the, the uh, access to a kiln and they need an access to a community that's going to support them. Mm. And they need access to a way to put the food on the table. I mean, these are practical things. Absolutely. You know, without those practical things being taken care of, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to have the freedom to uh, to 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 work, sort of to, to make work and allow that to take you where you want to go. You'll be so worried about you know all these other things. I mean, that's what I did. Frankly, I I, I lived in a shoebox for uh, I mean that metaphorically, but a, a shoebox for many years. But the important thing was that it was inexpensive. I had a little studio. I had a kiln. And I had a way of making a living. So that allowed me to develop, to just go in and work, you know, in the studio whenever I was able to do so. so. One of the things that I have heard from a number of people is this notion of community and how important the community is. is. Um, can you talk about maybe what you see as the ideal way for a community to around clay to develop? Well, I think um, the ideal way is, of course, school. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I have met a lot of students who graduate from school that say that was their their most creative time mm. because they, without any effort, they had that community, and without any effort, they had somebody guiding them. Where it was not a gallery, for example, it was like a teacher. So they had that mentorship and they had that community and, and that community would go in and they'd talk about clay. So anything that can sort of be like that, like even the friends you have from, well, there are, there are I'm sort of squarely here, there are, there are sort of art centers where you can find friends. There are um, workshops. Uh, I think workshops are very, very popular. I, Lisa Clay does a kick-ass workshop and, and uh, just to put in a little ad for her. But it also seems like there's, there's a sort of, um, that's where you find friends yeah. is in, in a workshop environment. Um, and of course, on the internet, on Instagram, I go to Instagram a lot to find out other local artists and what they're doing and to find other artists and what they're doing. So there are ways to build communities. And, and basically I have stayed in touch with people that I've met during, you know, students. Um, and, you know, we hang out together too. But, so there are various ways to find even one other person who does the same thing. I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and find a way for people to uh, gently critique each other and to be uh, nice in that whole process as opposed to being mean, which I think many times young artists are afraid of the critique. Uh, and sometimes people are uh, too critical in that process. Well, the thing about friends is that they never say anything critical. You know, is that, I just love that. I think right. the way it works really well is, is more by example. 
you know, yes. yeah. um, then, then by, I don't use the word critique. So I use evaluations mm. because I, I remember when the time when I was six years old and somebody said they didn't like a piece and I never did it again, you know? So I, I, I don't like that whole approach because young artists, when they come out, what they lack is confidence. And I don't think it, I don't think it builds confidence to be critical you could also, you can always make suggestions. Have you thought about doing this or you thought about doing that and direct them without saying, wow, that looks a little bit like, you know. So I, as a teacher, I'm not a, a big fan of critiques. Critiques, yes, yeah. absolutely. I, uh, I'm i like you. I can remember early in my life when people made a critical comment and that shut me down completely. Yeah. And uh, and yet I was over taking some training in England uh, a couple of years ago and we were to make this piece and the instructor came over and what I had made was a piece of junk and I knew it was a piece of junk and he didn't say a thing. He just uh, sort of looked at me and that was enough, right? To, yeah, yeah, for, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, we didn't need to get into any details and, uh, and working with other people, the conversation comes around to, well, what else could you try as opposed to what you have you done wrong in this particular piece? Well, it's to me, it's the sandwich, you know, you, yes. you put something positive. Uh, it, it is true. That being said, before I sound like a little angel, I have told my students, holy shit, you know, that's <laughs> awful. But only because I have spent a long time telling them that what they do is terrific. Yes. So, you know, I, I can say something, wow, that's really great. You're doing really well. Wow, that's not so good, but that's really great. So basically you're sandwiching it. You're building up their confidence and then saying, that is not up to your talent. You know, so yes, yes, in yes. a way you can do it in a way that they, you know, that, that they're okay with it. You know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Hey, it's been awesome having this conversation with you here this morning, Margaret. Uh, mm -hmm. It has been great. Is there anything that you would like to tell the audience that we haven't touched on here that you think is important in the context of color and surface? Uh, well, of course, um, I think experimentation and, and not being afraid to experiment is really important. Yeah. Um, I have a, um, I mean, the reason why I ended up doing this sort of tromploy is because that is one of the assignments in my classes. And it is astonishing how close you can get to something using clay. If, as long as you allow yourself that, you know, um, and it's a really good exercise. It's not that meaningful to a lot of my students because you you pull out the the concept and you pull out the invention and all it is is technical stuff. So, but it's a really good exercise. And so that's, I guess, what I would say is that it it is remarkable what there is out there for ceramic artists to to play with and to experiment with. It's true. Uh, playing, experimenting, trying. Uh, a local potter said to me, in every kiln firing, there better be something in that kiln that's an experiment. And yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a good message to have. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And everything is fixable. I mean, I always just tell my students, glue is your friend. <laughs> you, know, you could glue things. And I would say, you know, don't be precious about your work. You know, you can, if it breaks, you can find something to do with it. You can fix it or at least learn from it. So, yeah, absolutely. Margaret, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. Uh, we appreciate it immensely. Well, thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for listening to the Color and Ceramics podcast with Bob Acton and his guests. Please help others find the podcast by subscribing to this podcast wherever you find your podcasts, such as iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube, or other podcatchers. And don't forget to give us a review. We'll see you next time.